Yeah, so fishy. And now we're live and people are starting to come in. Hello, everybody. We're going to let everybody in out of the waiting room and then we will get started. Thank you all for being here. Feel free to jump right into the chat. I looked at the attendees list and I know we have some chatters. Not naming any names. <laughs> I can think of one. <laughs> Can see everybody coming in so we will just we will just <laughs> let everybody get in and and then we'll get started <laughs> all right thank you all so much for being here hello and welcome my name is emily summer and i'm the book buyer at east city book in dc it's a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Then introduce yourself and comment. We love seeing your names. We love see where, seeing where you're watching from. And we really appreciate the accessibility that these virtual events provide, but we do miss being able to see your faces. The chat allows us a little of that interaction, so please don't be shy. Our events coordinator and assistant store manager, Lainey Rose Riser, is also monitoring the chat tonight for any technical difficulties. So if you have any issues, please let us know. Next to the chat function at the bottom of your screen is the Q&A feature. We will have time tonight for your questions, so please put them there. That's where we'll be sure to see them. I will also try to monitor the chat, but if you can put them in the Q&A, they'll all be in the same place. And now for the reason that we're here. Jacqueline in Paris takes us to the City of Lights in September 1949, as Jacqueline Bouvier arrives in France to begin her junior year abroad. She's 20 years old and a student at Vassar, years away from becoming First Lady. Anne Ma's novel introduces us to a young woman finding her way in post-war, post-occupation Paris. This is the origin story, as the publisher's copy says, of an American icon, a dazzling work of historical fiction from Anne Ma. Anne is an American food and travel writer. She is the author of the USA Today and Wall Street Journal bestseller, The Lost Vintage, as well as three other books. She contributes regularly to the New York Times travel section, and her articles have appeared in the Washington Post, Condé Nast Traveler, The Best American Travel Writing, The New York Times Footsteps, Washingtonian Magazine, and other publications. As many of you know, Anne recently fell ill and is unable to tour and for the book's publication and launch. We really miss seeing her and we're so sorry she can't be with us tonight. We know that many of you are friends of Anne or fans and readers of Anne, and we've all been truly inspired and heartened at East City Bookshop to see so much support for her and for the novel. She is clearly, truly beloved. And while we miss seeing her, we're delighted that in her stead, we have two friends of Anne who are friends of East City Bookshop as well, and Jackie experts in their own rights, Stephen Rowley and Lewis Byard. Stephen Rowley is the best-selling author of Lily and the Octopus, a Washington Post notable book of 2016, the editor named by NPR and Esquire as one of the best books of 2019, and The Gunkle, a 2021 Goodreads Choice Awards finalist for Novel of the Year. His fiction has been published in 20 languages. He's worked as a freelance writer, newspaper columnist, and screenwriter. Originally from Portland, Maine, he's a graduate of Emerson College and currently resides in Palm Springs with his husband, the writer Byron Lane. In the words of the New York Times, Lewis Byard reinvigorates historical fiction, rendering the past as if he'd witnessed it firsthand. His acclaimed novels include The Pale Blue Eye, soon to be a Netflix motion picture starring Christian Bale, the national bestseller courting Mr. Lincoln, Roosevelt's Beast, The School of Night, The Black Tower, and Mr. Timothy, as well as the highly praised young adult novel, Lucky Strikes. His reviews and articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, and Salon. An instructor at GW University, he is the chair of the Penn Faulkner Awards and was the author of the popular Downton Abbey recaps for the Times. Lou and Steve, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it so much and can't wait to hear the conversation. Well, thank you. I'm going to leap in, Steve. I'm going to leap yes, in. Thank teacher, you, Emily. Professor. Professor, please. That's right. That's right. Thank you, Emily, for that lovely introduction. 
we're so sad that Anne can't join us so that we could lavish some love on her. So we're just kind of going to try to do as much as we can, the two of us. But what a wonderful excuse to hang out with Mr. Rowley, a writer whom I greatly admire and um, I'm a big fan of. So this is this is a, a treat to be Back here. Back at you, yeah. We're, we'll try to keep it light tonight. Um, I know as a writer, I said one of the best ways to support uh, someone is to buy the book. So be sure. Everyone, right. Buy the book and you, you won't even, like this is a really good book. We both got a chance to read an early copy and um, I'm really thrilled to be here in support of and, the book. And, and I'm great, gonna, yeah, great place to buy books from is East City Books, just in case you're wondering. Just in case bookstore. you're wondering. And where I think to buy I see. I think so, I see uh, Chris, uh, Anne's husband, and daughter Lucy may be joining in as well. So we want to give them a warm welcome and say how thrilled they are that they can they can stop by too. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'll begin. You want me to begin? I'll be the yeah, professor. Please, please, Steve. yeah. I'll be the professor. So I Take was trying to, to find school. the. the <laughs> I was trying to find the theme that would unite all three of us, you, me, and Anne. And it occurred to me, we talked about this um, last night, actually. We were talking about that all our books, respectively, are about the Jackie who's not that Jackie, the Jackie who's not the public Jackie. She, but it's either before she becomes that Jackie or it's after she becomes that Jackie. And there's, in your case, uh, she's a professional book editor. So, um, and there's, there's, there's something quite, I don't know, um, indecent, <laughs> right? About taking this public icon and kind of looking at her um, in a private light. I don't know, have you, did you feel that way? Oh, for sure. Um, and I think what's interesting if you take, so sort of chronologically, Anne's book would come first, right? And yes, then absolutely. Jackie and me, your book, and, and my book would sort of bring up the rear as my book focuses on her life after her, you know, she sublimated so much of her life to these two marriages. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of finally burst through on her own. What I sort of like is these three books um, without the middle section of her life that we know that that yeah. we know because I think there's another version of Jackie. And I say I say Jackie. I know um, it's you know I I should say Mrs. Onassis. I think when when talking about her, particularly from when I'm writing about her. But yeah. you know I, I think you know we're all so we all feel such affinity and a familiarity with her now after after doing so much research and, and you know, spending so much time uh, in her shoes. Um, but there's a version of Jackie that could go right from Paris into sort of a young dating world, figuring out who she is as a, as a young woman and then becoming a career woman without being sidetracked as right. you know, a political wife or um, you know, a socialite or whatnot um, that she might have preferred. Absolutely. And it's funny. One of the things one of the things in my own book is just the, the paths she could have taken uh, had she not met Jack Kennedy, had she not done all these other things, because she did think of herself as a career woman. As Anne says in her book, her inscription uh, at, at Miss Porter's School for Girls in the yearbook was mm -hmm. her goal was not to be a housewife. And yeah. um, and certainly going to Paris was was part of that experience was not I don't want to just marry the first guy who comes along. Yeah. I think so, it's right when, when when thinking of Anne's book, I, I always think like, okay, well, she, is it is it Jacqueline is the American pronunciation? Is this yes. Jacqueline in Jacqueline. Paris? There was a weird sort of weird in between Jacques Jacqueline, uh, you know. And I I will admit to going a little more lowbrow and and w having watched Emily in Paris on Netflix, which I think <laughs> is supposed to be called Emily in Paris. So now maybe it's it's Jacqueline good of you to admit in, that you watched that. That was, that yeah. was nice of you to admit that. Yeah. <laughs> That's about the level of French I can speak, so I feel really good when I watch that. Um, yeah. But, but how, I think there's something different between when, when we use Jacqueline or Jacqueline and when we use mm -hmm. Jackie. Are we talking about different people when we do that? Are we talking yeah. about, yeah. To me, Jackie is the, is the, is the person we've colonized yeah. as a people. Jackie is that, that, that tabloid creature, that, that style icon. And Jacqueline is something a little different. It's a little more private. It's a little more her. Um, two things quickly. You asked me if, if I felt, uh, you know, some guilt over 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 diving into the parts of her life that were more private, that were more hers and hers alone. Um, you know, for me, writing about her career, I think, you know, her career after her marriages, where she had a truly spectacular third act. Uh, you know, fifteen years mm -hmm. working in book publishing, and I think when people. Um, 
when she was hired, I think a lot of people expected that, you know, maybe it was a vanity hire or for her Rolodex that she had access to mm -hmm. people that they wanted, the publisher wanted to write books. But no, she did the hard work of, you know, put her head down, did the hard work of line editing. She was incredibly talented and then edited more than 100 books. I think that's one of the most fascinating things about her. And it's not even in the top five um, things that we think about when we mm -hmm. remember her. And conversely, I think, you know, I don't, I, I wouldn't want to speak for you, but, but some of these parts that are private are truly the parts that make her remarkable um, mm -hmm. uh, in a way. And so I, you know, yes, it's probably a little bit of an invasion, but yet uh, I want it to be celebrated. I want, mm -hmm. you know, I want that, you know, cause she's so much more than I think what people think of her at first, at first, uh, at first glance. Well, and that raises the whole question that you and I and Anne have all dealt with is the, the morality of, of taking a public figure, a real life figure, and God knows mm -hmm. I've, I've done that myself a bit, uh, and, and, and putting them into a fictional setting. Um, what, what do we owe that person, do you think, in terms of fidelity to history, fidelity to fact? What are we allowed to do with that person? Yeah, and it's interesting to choose to do it in fiction too. Like yeah, why yeah. why not write nonfiction? Like, what are the choices? And you know, Anne is an incredibly talented uh, travel writer, for instance. Yeah. And so, I mean, she could have, you know, and that is, you know, she approaches that with, you know, with a with a nonfiction eye. So, to the fact, you know, that she chose to write about uh, Jackie in the stages of her life, um, not only in a novel format, but writing in the first person as well. Like, oh what my God, that was so gutsy. Undertaking that, Neither of us you know, did that. Neither of us did <laughs> no, that. No, we didn't have the guts. <laughs> we didn't have the guts. Uh, you know, and maybe maybe that was a wise decision on our part, just being men too, that, um, you know, I do think about what, uh, what I can do and what I can do authentically. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is an interesting, um, it is an interesting choice. Well, yeah, I, I I remember I thought about this, and to me, the Jackie, I call her. We're we're, talk, we're call her Jackie or for Jackie shorthand, Clark. yeah, for the shorthand, purposes yeah. of this conversation, yeah, for the purpose of Jackie. To me, she's such a mysterious figure. It's kind of the way I feel about Lincoln. I can't I can't get so deeply into that head that I could do the first person. And to me, it's 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 almost more effective to look at her from the perspective of another character, just as you do, mm -hmm. um, with with the protagonist of your author. Um, but, um, so, but I can see that if you, if you get a young enough version of Jackie as Anne did, that maybe that is possible because she's still unformed and she's this inchoate being just, you know, still just two years at Vassar, um, and then a year at the Sorbonne still waiting. So she's still a, a work in progress in effect. Well, you can imagine what that's like. And particularly for those of us who have been lucky enough to travel to France, that's sort of devastation that returning stateside and sometimes have when you feel <laughs> as a young person when you feel like you have discovered something that right. uh, is just beyond uh your your dreams and so uh, it's one of the things that Anne, you know got so so brilliantly yeah um, not yeah. only does she she done this incredible research into the woman but uh the research that she has done to make paris so come alive i mean she's in the yes. soul of, she, she renders jackie's soul but the city's soul yeah, absolutely. At that time as well, which was a you know fascinating time in in the city's history and in Europe's uh, history as well, but sort of being like uh, World War II post. I was going to say this is a very vexed historical period. We are we are post war. We're what what are we five years five years out of the war? Mm -hmm. um, and this is not you know the Paris of of, of tourist brochures. This is right. a, 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 a country that's been scarred. Um, the memory of the Holocaust is still fresh. Um, the, the memory of, of of the French resistance, the French occupation, um, and it's everywhere. And one of the things I found fascinating was that she, she went in the genre that Anne went in the genre direction of the spy novel, which mm. which which mm. makes sense because at this time um, there's a lot of communist presence in in Paris, particularly in the student body, and so we have communist spies and anti-communist spies, and it's all delightful and it makes perfect sense given the, the time period that she's writing about. Yeah, and then and then also to sort of glimpse a little bit of romance and love too, because yeah. you cannot, no matter when we talk about Paris, you can't ever get away from that too. But I was thinking too, it's really fascinating for the mirrors of what we think of Jackie in terms of the, you know, in terms of Camelot. You know, we romanticize yeah. that time too, 
but that that she has is sort of these brushes with communism and and whatnot in, in Anne's book. And then you think about the the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you think about you know we have a we have such a romanticized memory of of Camelot, but against the backdrop of of civil rights struggles and right. uh, a lot of uh, racism and uh, you know. Um, anti-Catholicism and, you know, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of darkness during that time here yeah. um, as well. And so there's something about, about Jackie that allows us to, to think about it with a romantic lens, even, th even though um, there were certainly darker forces at play. For sure. But it's interesting because I think the sense that I get, right, the reason Anne chose this year is that she feels that that was the year in which Jackie was happiest or most purely herself that's the mm -hmm. feeling i think from the stuff that jackie herself said later that this was the time where she felt happiest and maybe for the reasons that we were just discussing that she hadn't been ossified into these roles of wife or first lady or widower or divorce or whatever that she that she could should explore and and what better place to do it than yeah, and those of us who have really uh, a, a real affinity for the woman, I th I think that um, don't we want her to be happy? You know, like there's <laughs> part of me that reads Anne's novel and and want to hit pause and be like, no, I I sort of want her to have this um, singularity and experience and, and happiness sort of forever because you know ultimately there's a lot of tragedy that uh, surrounds her life, um, you know, down the line and it, it doesn't stop. You know, I was thinking. God, she passed away in, in 1994. She could still very much be here. To this She'd be day. 90 she now? Would she be 90? Would she be 90, 90 now? Yeah, 90, 91, I think, um, yeah. now. Um, and we were talking about her sister Lee just passed away, you know, yeah. more recently. Yeah. Um, but that she's been gone since, you know, almost 30 years now. Um, it's really remarkable to remember how young she actually was when she herself died. I mean, what an extraordinary life, but right. she was incredibly young when she passed mm -hmm. away at 64, I think. Um, and so, um, yeah, I just, uh, I just took such joy in reading, um, you know, this, this take of her, uh, of this woman um, coming into her own in Paris. Yeah, I think as, as chroniclers of her, don't we all just huddle over her, right? And just want to, I, I wind up feeling very protective of her, you know, knowing, right? And as you discussed, knowing what she was coming up is like, oh gosh. Yeah. Um, and then again, imagining imagining what might have been. I do want to call up um, so an overlap between my book and, and Anne's because because it fascinates Please. me. So um, so Jackie meets a guy named Jack, mm -hmm. who, a Harvard a Harvard boy named Jack. It's not the one you're thinking. Not the Jack you're thinking. Yeah. <laughs> not the Jack you're thinking. Um, it's a it's a gentleman, a real life gentleman named John Mark P. Marquand Jr. I have no idea if I'm saying that last name right. Do you know Steve Marquand? Marquand? I do. I told you the limits to my French are what they say on Emily and <laughs> <laughs> He's right. Macron. Yeah, Macron. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> we got to do the hands with it. Ma Macron. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Mark, we'll just say Marquand. Um, <laughs> so um, anyway, so his John P. Marquand Jr.'s father was actually a very famous novelist at the time. J um, um, J.P. Marquand, and he, who was famous for writing these satirical uh, portraits of the Boston Brahmin upper class set. That probably his best known book was um, the late George Apley. He also wrote, as Anne's book mentions, this series of bizarre uh, mysteries around a Mr. Moto, who was a Japanese detective, played me. long lost to history. But he was very famous in his day, and his son clear was was trying to be a novelist in the same mode and and he he and Jackie got together um the details about what happened are sparse but it's interesting because I went with the story that did not paint a very romantic portrait and Anne kind of found the tenderer part of that but also some dark dark things too but one of the things that comes out is John is an aspiring author and he has a manuscript and he hands it to Jackie oh, just just to edit uh and it's like and I was thinking of you, Steve, because this is where it began. This is the intersection Jackie, where all our books are coming together. Editor begins yeah. right here with with yeah. with Johnny or Jack Jack Marquand. So, um, by the way, so many Johns and Jacks in her. I life. know that's the thing. I mean, She's really... it's crazy how many Johns and Jacks. Her her dad, Black um, Jack, yeah. her her fiance was a guy named Johnny Husta Jr. And uh, yeah, lots of lots of them. But I guess it was a more common name in those days. I don't know. I guess. Anyway. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, John, but, yeah, but, it's not like it's so uncommon now, but yeah. Yeah, but I think even more so then. But 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 one of the things he says to her is like he he refers to her as a brutal editor, and I thought, oh, I wonder if that's what she carried forward into that later career. Did, well, did you get the sense that, she was brutal? I did get the sense she was brutal, um, and then uh, you know she could be ruthless with that pen, you know strike this, this is full of treacle, this is, uh, you know, too sentimental. And so she would have this sort of tender um, ability to seduce you in person in that way, where you think like, oh, wow, this is, you know, she has that whispery voice, maybe she is going to be a gentle, caring, you know, we saw her, this image of her as sort of America's mother in a way, you know, particularly where she led the nation through grief, you have this sort of idea of what it's going to be like to interact with. And then on paper, it could just be, you know, she was very skilled and shrewd and had a had a really um, thoughtful eye. And so, uh, but it, on paper, it, came, it would and it would be extra devastating just that these notes were coming from you. Listen, it's always hard to get notes uh, right. on your work, well, right? But now well, imagining feeling like you've let her down uh, in a way, uh, I, I can only imagine. You talked about the Jackie voice. So we, in the, we all know what, what we think of as the Jackie voice. And it, there actually aren't that many recordings of it. because, uh -uh. But it's that very, as you said, this very whispery, almost baby doll, frankly, kind of Marilyn Monroe kind of voice, very yeah. whispery, very soft, um, designed, one would think, to have people lean in closer to, to, to get to, to understand exactly. what she's saying. But you listen to a recording of her. I did, yeah. So yes. uh, I later did a, in a, life, a, a, not later that in voice. Life, I, I yeah, I did a, a wonderful uh, event at Trident Books in Boston, where uh, there's a professor up there named Bill Kuhn who wrote a book called Reading Jackie, which is a nonfiction account of her time as an editor. It's a wonderful book. Um, if anyone has read the editor and is interested in knowing more about her time in book publishing, but we did an in conversation event, and he brought with her a re voicemail recording that an author had gifted him who had worked with Jack. Jackie was uh, her editor. And then back in the day when he had these uh, recording machines where you could take the little tiny tape out and whatnot, she'd given him that. And so we played it uh, at the book event and it was not the whispery uh, Jackie voice. In fact, you know, this is this is career Jackie, uh, you know, a bit no nonsense, but uh, you know, hello, it's Jacqueline Onassis calling from New York, you know, as if, as if uh, it would be another Jackie Onassis, you know, the, the Jackie Onassis <laughs> from Bismarck or something. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that was really interesting to hear. But I do think, you know, like later, you know, particularly, um, she knew she knew her own myth and could not weaponize it in a way, but use it to her advantage. Um, and um, she was, uh, you know, as you say earlier, the, the the difference between Jackie and Jacqueline and Jacqueline, uh, yeah. I think, is very different. There's a moment in my book where. Um, it's clear that people want her to sign Jackie Kennedy Onassis, and she wouldn't give that to them. She would never, she wouldn't um, give them that delight. It was always, she would always sign things Jacqueline Onassis um, because uh, she felt she'd really served her duty to, to history and didn't need, mm -hmm. didn't need to be, um, you know, uh, anyway, to please any, to please yeah. anyone else in that way, you know, not on her terms. And yet she's buried next to her husband at Arlington National Cemetery, which is fascinating. It's that sense of duty, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. I think um, ultimately she couldn't get away from it. Yeah, uh, for sure, Yeah, for sure. Um, but speaking of the voice, we, we need to talk about the accent because nobody talks like that anymore. And I think Anne's book does a, really, any, it does a really good job of explaining where that comes from. It's this very elite, very small subsection of Long Island, basically, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think you'd have to, you, maybe Gre Grey Gardens is the only other place where you could find that accent <laughs> being spoken. It's it's lost to time, but it's fascinating to think that people once spoke that way by common consent, and th th this very strange accent. That... Yeah, one of the things that's really <clears throat> interesting is I would see, so, so in terms of writing the voice sometimes, you know, I, I heard, uh, so you've seen the, uh, Na the Natalie Portman uh, Jackie yes. movie, yeah. right? which is a really <laughs> extraordinary film. It's not, don't take it as a biopic per se. Right. It's a highly stylized Douglas Sirkian melodrama. 
version of Jackie, which I love, by the way. I would love to have a, a melodramatic- We, we love our Douglas. Of every oh mid-century first lady, like give me Beth Truman, give me Lady Bird, give me, <laughs> give me Mamie Truman, Eisenhower, give Douglas me Sirk. Oh my gosh. Mamie, you know, but- uh, <laughs> I saw an interview with Natalie Portman where she said she watched the um, she watched the the White House tour to get the voice oh, yes. uh, in her head. And there was one moment in particular where they're walking between the East Room and the Green Room, the Blue Room and the China Room, or what? I'm not even sure. But it's this long moment with the cameras following her, and it's an awkward thing because she's between two spots and she doesn't have a scripted thing to say in that moment. And she turns back to the camera and says, "I rather like a hall." I rather like a hall, like a hallway. Like who said, like what a weird, but you could see she's so uncomfortable. I just, we've all had those moments that made me feel for her because like, you just want to feel silence. Like, yeah. like I am now by babbling. But uh, so sometimes <laughs> I would do that before writing her dialogue. I'd be like, I rather like a hole. I rather like a hole. I rather like a hole. <laughs> so, but that's, um, I think she she must have grasped the the value of silence in terms of shaping her mystique. Do you think she she kind of understood that in an intuitive sense, or maybe it's even the political handlers of the of of the Kennedys um, kind of drilled that into her that she was she was more intriguing the less she said. I think absolutely, um, and I think it was also a frustration as well. I mean, I think she certainly understand how women were viewed and how harshly they would be viewed if they said more. To, and then yeah. to try to put her, you know, a positive spin on that would be to get power out of that, about out of saying less. Um, and so uh, I think she was a very shrewd in how she um, how she did that and and presented herself. And yeah. I have the advantage in my in my research, you know, because you know, in my book, she's 61, 62 years old takes place in the early 90s and not that long ago that I couldn't talk to people who were in the room with her, who, you know, worked with her. I got to speak with some of her co-workers. I got to speak with an author that she had edited. I got to, you know, hear stories from people who are now, by the way, in very senior positions in publishing because they were just kind of starting out, you know, 30 years ago uh, or more. But uh, they're, they're wonderful stories about, you know, sitting in a, a staff meeting uh, with her or, or, or observing her when she would choose to ask a question and when she wouldn't. And, and that's all from, you know, she brought all that lifetime of knowledge um, and how to sort of get her way in the corporate world from having navigated first uh, political world and, and yeah. sort of academia before that. Yeah, it's interesting. We were talking about voice. One of the one of the things that Anne's book leads to, and I don't think this is a spoiler, but to the, to the famous trip that the Kennedy the Kennedy's president and first lady Kennedy took to Paris mm -hmm. and where she completely wowed the the French media from the moment she got off and spoke to them in French that was mm -hmm. something that I don't think any first lady had ever been to do uh, been able to do before and that was that was I think a key moment in creating that 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 Kennedy mystique which was not just American which completely swept across Europe as well I mean they were they were a global oh. figure and and so the the um, this Anne's book becomes almost like the training ground of uh, uh, in a Colette way, you know, the training ground for yeah. this woman who will go out in the world and conquer hearts and things like yeah. that. Yeah, it really is. It really is extraordinary. Um, yeah. And I love, you know, I just generally I love an origin story anyway. Yeah. And so you know, and that's what what Anne's book does so marvelously is not just it gets all this across, and yet it's a wonderful novel too. I mean, it's it's. And that's always the hard part when you're writing um, about a central figure that is so well known. Did you ever mm -hmm. run into this where if you thought, oh, for the purposes of my story that I'm trying to construct, it would be so helpful if Jackie said this or if Jackie <laughs> did this. But you knew for a fact that Jackie would never have done that or never have said that. Um, and yeah, so you have but... to find another way around it. Or we, that's, or you just say, that's why I'm a novelist. And I'll just, I'll just right, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Who gives a shit? Um, um, no, that's interesting because one of the things I get asked a lot, I'm sure you were asked too about the editor is like, how much of this really happened? Mm -hmm. And I, that question frustrates me a little bit as a novelist, because I'm in the business of writing a story that, that is maybe grounded in fact, that has fact-based elements and real life people, but is also a story that goes kind of where it needs to go. And, and so I get frustrated with the what I, I consider the nickel and diming of saying, well, this this happened or this didn't happen or this this happened, but I don't know if you you get that so much with the editor or not. 
Yeah, I would get questions about what was it really like to work with her? And I would look, well, you see those two magical words on the cover, a novel, like that <laughs> no. wasn't really me. Um, you know, yeah. I, I had an advantage in my situation and is, is the bulk of my story is a mother son love story. And these were fictional mm -hmm. characters. And, right. and Jackie was more of a supporting character uh, in my novel. So whenever I felt constrained by her, I was like, oh, I can have my other court characters that I did sort of create out of whole cloth. like. I can have them be have always a you know I had more flexibility there, but you have you know uh, your your sort of character is Lem Billings, your other character Lem yeah. Billings, and then Jack too as much. We were both you know Lem was a real life uh, individual mm -hmm. as well, so I don't know if you felt more more constrained or not. I don't feel constraints, and I I feel guilty that I don't sometimes. Yeah. Uh, to me to me. Uh, what historical novelists do is they fill the, they plug the gaps in the historical record. They tell us the stuff that we that we don't know. Um, about, yeah, because here's the thing: you can do yeah. all the research in the world, and you will never know every yeah. thought that went through their head. You will never have every piece of it. So there's a percentage, and it's true of Anne's book too, I'm sure. But you know, this is just. Um, a statement about her talent is like you have to fill it in you have to fill it in yeah. with you there's a there's a you know it's my interpretation of jackie and this is Anne's interpretation of that jackie and your interpretation of yeah. her and jackie and me it's um it's an interesting um interesting thing did you ever hear from any of uh lem's anyone who knew lem or family or yes anybody? i've heard I, not directly i've heard from his his um niece who's still alive mm -hmm. and from a, a couple of people who knew him when he was young and that they said that their portrayal was pretty spot on which i'm grateful for i'm grateful for um but here's the thing do you get and i, and I wonder if Anne is going to get any of this do you get this whole people asking well you know have you have you heard back from the candidates it's like yeah. i'm feeling they they they've had i'm not on their radar I don't think they, yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> I'm not on their I love that you this. Well, there's a there's a couple things I hear. One is, uh, yeah, did did you send the book to Carolyn? And uh, no, I did. <laughs> did you not. bet it? Through, did you run it by I Carolyn? I didn't bet it. Yeah, I didn't. Listen, there's a there. Are, you know, when you asked me earlier, dude, I feel any guilt. That's where I feel. You know, there's there's been enough people who've traded off the Kennedy name to make mm -hmm. uh, a name for themselves or or money for their own right. And you know, I I feel I did this as respectfully as I could, but I don't need to bother, you know, Carolyn Kennedy with this. Uh, yeah book and i'm not going to do it the closest i got i think i got was uh you know a, a, a bookseller uh, on martha's vineyard because there's an extensive section of my book that takes place on martha's vineyard where mm -hmm. she did sort of retreat to work sometimes mm -hmm. um is that carly simon went in uh to a bookstore on martha's vineyard and bought a copy of the editor and so i'm like i'm getting closer you know because carly uh simon and jackie were good friends and in yes. fact jackie edited a number of children's books um that Carly wrote. So, and and then later, Carly, uh, I think just last year, released a nonfiction book about her relationship with Jackie. So, yes, uh, she was at, this, she was at Jackie's deathbed, I think. Yeah, or, this, or this circle close. is closing. By the way, Carly Simon, I didn't know uh, until my research is Simon of Simon and Schuster. Yeah, uh, yeah. Somehow yeah. that had evaded me. It this all thing. circles. The, it all circles. The around. second thing, all circle. Yeah, the second thing is that. Uh, the, her home, Redgate Farm on Martha's Vineyard, Jackie's home, uh, came up for sale uh, in 20, summer of 2019, just after the editor came out. And, and, and I had so many people reach out to me or send me the listing and say, I should buy it. It was on the market for $65 million. So I think the other Get misconception that, people have is not Get only on am I not famous enough to be on Carolyn Kennedy's radar, novelists do not make what uh, you think we all make because uh, mm. there's no way I could have purchased that. J.K. Rowling could have done it. I, I, feel, I feel J.K. Rowling could have done it and, and Stephen King perhaps, but yeah. Yeah, maybe, yeah. But, but not us workaday uh, authors, yeah. Well, one of the things that struck me when I was researching my book, and I want—I really want to talk to Anne about this too, is, is um, I felt all the stuff that happened, it happened within living memory. We're talking, in my case, it's 1951, 52, and, and Anne's book is really just the car that, that sidles up to my bumper, you know, and just touches it a little bit. So we're, we're, we're pretty continuous. Uh, I was amazed how little agreement there is among historical sources about what happened, about even, you know, how ja basic stuff like how Jack and Jackie met, where they met, when did they start dating, all the, how they proposed. There's a place yeah. in DC called Martin's Tavern, which has a plaque on a booth that, that insists that's where Jack proposed to Jackie. But in fact, research says it probably happened on a transatlantic phone call from to London where she was covering the Queen's coronation. Um, so 
so the fact that there's that history itself is not an agreement makes me think history itself is its own kind of fiction. Like, like, right. And yet how long ago does that feel? And yet the queen's coronation and the queen just passed just away. Dying. Like it's just, we are all not as far from history as, as we think we are sometimes. Yeah. And that's really yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I just happened to notice this question in the chat box about collaborating on, on novels. I don't think uh, we, I don't, I don't think you knew I was writing my, I read your book. I read your book, but I also read an article from Anne, Anne that she wrote for the New York Times. I, I had not met her at this point at all, but it was, a, <clears throat> it was a nonfiction article about Jackie's year in Paris. And it was enormous help just to understand kind of where she went, what she was doing, where she stayed, and it helped to know. For instance, helped me to, when I was reading her novel to know that 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 much is factual. The the family she stayed with that that mm -hmm. they existed, and in fact, I think one of them may still be alive. Speaking of people who are still alive, to kind of vet your vet your history. So again, it's that that question of of um, working within a historical framework and then letting yourself um, go free. Um, yeah, so I, the, I want to. Yeah. I just need to jump in because I see that in the comments as well. And I think I, I think I'm going to take a stab here that this might be Mrs. Sally of my uh, of the fourth grade class who uh, was a fan of the Gunkel. Uh, but anyway, uh, hi, Mrs. <laughs> Sally. <laughs> that yeah. is indeed. Uh, I'm so thrilled you're here. Um, so yeah, and and there isn't always uh, agreement, or there are lots of you know. You, you think about someone, there are, there's endless research that can, can be done under, there's so many right. books about the Kennedys, about uh, Jackie in particular, like it's impossible for one person to read them all. So in focusing mm -hmm. your research, um, you know, or, or as we each did, picking a very specific moment in her life sort of helps, you know, I, I love that uh, Emily would say that we're Jackie experts, but I'm, I'm an expert on a very small oh. window of Jackie's life and that no, is yeah. it. Um, and then sometimes I found the more inspirational stuff in terms of not in terms of fiction writing with some of the non-traditional things I did um, or the, um, you know, sort of things on the side that I did the types of research. For instance, I ordered the auction catalog of her belongings after she passed away. The, it was Sotheby's or, or I forget mm -hmm. the auction house. But just because I wanted to see her things like that helped me get into her mind a little bit. OK. What was the desk she sat at when she worked? What was, you know, where did she read at home? What did she sit on? You know, that kind of stuff was fascinating to me because I could picture, you know, a woman that we would never imagine kicking off her shoes, but seeing her kick off her shoes. And like, that just yeah. feels very intimate in a way that most people would never get to see that, but that I can feel a connection to, right? I like to kick off my shoes and read. So, um, you know, that was lots of fun. I went so far as to read the other books that she was editing at the time of uh, my, that my story takes place because I wanted to know what other stacks of paper were on her desk, yeah, what yeah, other yeah. manuscripts, what were the ideas that really interested her in that moment? And, um, you know, what were what thoughts might have been at the forefront of her mind? And that that's the kind of stuff that was really helpful to me. And so even though there's not necessarily a lot about her day to day life, um, you know, in the office, it was some it was research like that that sort of helped me uh, imagine. You know, it's funny because, um, yeah, I, thank you for flagging the word expert because I never feel like an expert about anything. I don't either. Yeah. Here, even at the right here, I've, the narrow little period I've, I've found. Um, I feel like I learned just enough to know, just enough to tell the story. Um, and then the stories will often tell me what I still need to know, and which is often yeah. considerable. And I never wind up feeling an expert, but it's interesting because I'm I, I'm careful just to catch them when they're young, whether it's Lincoln, <laughs> catch them when they're young, Lincoln, uh, Jackie, and then, then you don't have to know anything about later right. in their life. I have no idea what happened to Jackie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, if, you, if you had a stack of 100 books on your desk, then you can you can get rid of the top. like Exactly. Just, yeah, uh, who cares? Who cares? <laughs> but but you coming from at the later thing, I feel like you have to actually sort of know that at least some level of that history going into. I feel like you have a harder research challenge. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't. It Yeah, it doesn't. Um, I always think like, yeah, what are the, what are some of the emotional truths more than um, the, you know, sort of more than the, the timeline exactly or the, or what was exactly factual. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I was always interested in like a lot of the travel that she'd done, you know, she did incredible, you know, the, mm -hmm. or, or some, uh, the interests, you know, dance, Russian czars, 
um, costume, uh, fashion, you know, that sort of uh, stuff always sort of interests me because I think like, uh, all right, that helps me get into the soul of the person as much as some sort of biographical timeline of what they accomplished in what moment. Yeah. W one of the research elements, um, oh, I actually, this leads me, I'm, I'm answering one of the questions. Of, anything surprising about her in Anne's book? So it's not surprising, it's more reinforcing how much damn cigarettes she smokes in this book. She is, she is off the top with her cigarette smoking. And as I understood it, she, she was always a little embarrassed about it. I think it comes out in the Natalie Portman movie too. She mm -hmm. kind of doesn't want people to know that she's a smoker, but she's a, like a chain smoking kind of in, in yeah. and her mother was the same way. Yeah. So it's fun to see her just, just going off the, off the chain with the cigarettes because they're all over the place as they should be in a, in a, in a book set in that, that period. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. The, and, and that carried, that carried through by the way you yeah. know she had the, you know the jackie that i wrote about with that the lampshade of hair you know sometimes yeah. <laughs> hair would still smell of cigarettes uh yeah. but also finding like the but that's not unusual for the time either. absolutely yeah. and so you know yeah. finding some of that culture and and like the cocktail culture you know in uh, my book picture uh, a, a daiquiri that she makes and which is you know a drink she enjoyed which is not the sort of blender and ice and spring break woo -woo yeah. kind of daiquiri yeah. but the you know uh, a, a sort of a Cuban rum and, uh, you know, and lime juice or something, uh, or rum made with um, sugar cane, um, true sugar cane. So, yeah. um, you know, it was something they would do and she would, dr and Jack and uh, something would drink those with, with Ben Bradley and his wife when they, when he was, yeah. he was the editor of the Washington Post and you were sort of like, wow, I loved knowing things like that. Um, yeah. But also the idea of the president socializing with the editor of the of the paper dc papers oh, yeah. uh, like it seems horrifying in this uh in this day and age <laughs> or it would have yeah and, and, yeah. and i think for, for fox news or probably would not be would not be considered horrifying. yeah but, yeah i think one yeah. other thing that's interesting with ann's book is to sort of see um her uh relationship with the, the way she viewed viewed men and and sort of mm -hmm. young men and then and then also had an affinity for gay men also i mean we're both um you know uh gay men you're <laughs> talking about talking about her too like i th i was fascinated by by that uh element as well jackie and her gaze yeah, yeah. she there there's a young man I, I think also a real a real person um a young man who she learns is gay and she talks gore vidal comes up um mm -hmm. once 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 or twice and that he was related to her by marriage so I, I was going to ask you, Steve, what do you think is the affinity? Because um, I know you're an expert in all things gay. You live in Palm Springs. You know these things. So Yeah, I'm um, the mayor of gay. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think is, the, what's the affinity with Jackie and the gays? Why, why, well, why, you why, know, why do you so much? I, I don't know if I've ever um, thought about this in a way to put it in a sentence. But I will say this, like one person, you know how, you know, you do a book event and you, some of the same questions keep popping up and popping yeah. up. And then once in a while you get one out of left field and you're like, oh. Um, and I had someone ask me when I was on tour for the editor, did you choose to make your lead character gay to diffuse the obvious sexual tension that there would be with Mrs. Onassis? And, you know, and so in my book, you know, the, the character's 31 or 32 and she's 61 or 62. So, you know, I, it never would have occurred to me that there would be an intense sexual connect, uh, you know, like a, a draw there. But I, I think like it's, that's not. The more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, that's not, uh, you know, she was an incredibly beautiful woman. That's not, it's, maybe it's not as far afield as I would have thought. And so maybe part of the attraction was people who could see her um, outside the context of, of domestication and, yeah. um, you know, the other parts of her life, which were kind of a sacrifice to her and were more engaged with her mind. Um, and, and I can see that being an attraction. Yeah, I mean, I, to me, when it, Jackie and Me is, as you mentioned, is narrated by Lem Billings, who was a, a closeted um, gay man, or as he used to say, a practicing homosexual. Um, yeah. I always love that phrase because they, they keep practicing. Practicing. They get I'm, I'm gonna, they get I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna keep my amateur <laughs> status so that I can compete in the Olympics. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, and, and apparently that was something that Jackie knew about and Jack Kennedy knew about, and they were both, they were both very live and let live. And I have to think that the the sentimental education that um, Anne describes so well in her book was part of that meeting a, a, meeting a, a gay man and being in Paris yeah. and that sophisticated kind of culture 
made yeah. her very there's, very... there's even a, a little uh, uh james baldwin uh a brief uh moment oh yes that's right that. yeah. jimmy yeah. that's right so that's right re really fascinating because it's impossible it's impossible to write about jackie and not these uh you know figures that come in and out of it's just a life that we can't um, yeah. it's hard for someone like me certainly to imagine um, also cameo appearances by George Plimpton and Peter Matheson yeah. uh, who helped create with John Mark Juan Jr. helped create um, the Paris Review came out of yeah. kind of came yes. out of that world yeah which yeah. may have been have had, had ulterior motives but I won't spoil them for for people who haven't read the book yet <laughs> um, oh here we go Steve yeah did Jack, Jackie O edit a Michael Jackson book she did in fact um, it was not her happiest moment as an editor uh, but they had signed Michael Jackson to write uh, an autobiography and he didn't deliver and he didn't deliver and he didn't deliver and he took the publisher's money and never turned in any pages and he wouldn't listen to the editor he'd been assigned to. So they thought, who is bigger? Who is the one person we have in our arsenal who's bigger than Michael Jackson? And they put Jackie on a plane uh, to oh, wow. go uh, sit in a room with him and wrangle these pages. What, to never, never, did she go to Neverland? Did uh, she... I forget. It, I believe it was Neverland. Oh, yeah. Goodness. Uh, um, but uh, it was not a happy experience in her life. And she didn't like to be used uh, in that way, uh, you know, because she was essentially a babysitter uh, at that point. And I don't, I don't mean to infantilize uh, Michael Jackson that way, but he was not good about meeting deadlines, certainly in the way that a publisher expects. So. This is why you need professional writers in the end, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah. she was the only person that he would listen to. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Paris Review guys died last week. John Train. Oh gosh, I don't even know that that name. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. that either. They're they're oh, all. Oh look, it's Emily. Look at hello, Emily. Interrupt. Are you coming in to rescue us? Or are we getting? I, off no, off? no, I'm not. I I hate to interrupt. Get the hook. She's getting listen, the hook. I could listen to you all talk all night. <laughs> I love um the Steve and Lou book club. We should make it. A <laughs> we should um, make it a feature. Yeah. Yes, make it a feature. Um, but I did, I just dropped it in the chat, but it is it, time for questions, if that's okay with you yeah, all. Please. And mm -hmm. we have a few in the Q&A. Um, so one of them has already been answered that you have not heard from Caroline Schlossberg, um, but maybe via Carly Simon, we will. We'll, we'll see. see. No, I, 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 say, I don't think the Kennedys even bat an eye at this stuff anymore. I mean, I wrote about quite a bit about Ethel Kennedy, who's still alive, but I'm, I'm guessing, God knows, she's got better things to do than worry about some book that came out, um, I'm thinking, right? Well, I mean, there's been so many, there've been so many movies and books and TV shows. I can't imagine another one even makes them flutter, but. Well, we're, we are delighted to have you two um, talk about your most recent books about her and about um, Anne's beautiful book. So thank you again for being here. Um, so someone, let's see, Christopher asks, um, you both mentioned the research you did for your books, which I bet was a lot of work and spent a lot of time and energy researching Jacqueline mm -hmm. in Paris. What was the biggest surprise to you both as you discovered Jackie through your research? So we've talked a little bit about this, but I feel certain there are other surprises or favorite bits. For me, it was, and this kind of dovetails into what Steve's been talking about. To me, it was, she really was a career as a career girl, mm -hmm. as they would have said in those days, she really did have that aspiration. And she won a very prestigious uh, scholarship with Vogue magazine, for instance, um, which was later won by Joan Didion. It was a very, very high level kind of yeah. national competition. Uh, it, it kind of fell through, but she really did, did want to be a working woman. And I think she found a way to make that happen, even in the context of the White House and the renovation, all the work that she did in, in uh, recreating that, the White House and, and creating her own image too. I mean, she's, um, so she, I, I think in her own way, she was working her whole life. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing that uh, I, I, I'm just endlessly delighted by and something uh, in Lou's book as well, that, that is just, is, is so lovely is the, the, uh, her, uh, the rapport that she would have with a good, a sparkling conversationalist, you know, and, and she could be uh, very wryly uh, funny. Uh, and uh, I love sort of hearing stories where she, where her Wicked, humor- Wickedly, fu of, wickedly funny. Wick, yeah. Wickedly funny. Yeah. And there, there yeah. was a moment in particular where um, a story I heard from, from publishing time is they, she was doing this book on Egypt or, or sculptures or artwork of uh, Egyptian art. And she had selected an image for the cover and they were in the staff meeting and she was voted down. 
uh, that no, we can't use this image. It was a statue. It looked too much like a cone head, they said. And they said, no, you know, the Dan Aykroyd and Jane Curtin uh, characters from Saturday Night Live. <laughs> the, it's like a cone head. And, she, and so she had to, she tapped the shoulder of a young assistant, a young editorial assistant in the meeting. And she said, um, so sorry to interrupt. What is a cone head? Because she was disappointed <laughs> that her choice was, was shot down. And, uh, and so the assistant, well, I, well, it's this, you know, Saturday Night Live sketch, and they're making a movie out of it and, 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 at the time. And so she said, oh, okay. And then she came in, and she, several weeks later, she, she saw the assistant in the hall, and she said, she stopped her, and she said, now that I know what they are, I see cone heads everywhere. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know what that means exactly, but like, <laughs> is she seeing actual aliens? Is it, I think the, I think there was a movie, I think the movie was coming out around that, and there must have been like bus yes, shelter yes, yes. or something like that, but <laughs> we see cone heads everywhere. So Deborah asks, the real Jackie provides a framework and research basis for Anne's book, but could you say something about it, the book as just a work of fiction, just the novel as a novel? I'll, I'll just say, first of all, it's a very entertaining piece of fiction. That, that was the thing that attracted me to it. There's always, there's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very, very, um, very good on the scene setting, but also great on the, on the, on the scene, on the moving along part of it, uh, which you always want a historical novel. I think so many historical novels just get log jammed and, and, and um, dawdle with the research. They want that gold star, right? Because they did all the research. So here it is. Um, so, but I think Anne really recognizes what any novice does, which is there, there's a story that has to keep keep moving along. I think she's great at that. Yeah, and she's a you know that sort of travel writer at heart serves this novel so well. Yeah, you know, she could have yeah. picked a different subject, a different place, a different time, and maybe it wouldn't have all come together the way it does. But a, just a love and a reverence for uh, the city as well, and a, and she finds a way to write about it that is so immersive and doesn't, as as you said, sort of cobble you over the head with it, yeah, um, yeah. clobber yeah. you on the head with it. But, yeah. uh, it, and it just, it's just such a rich place to be as a reader. You know, you just did, want did this, to did, pick up that book always to re-enter that yeah. world. I know. Did it, did, did it make you hungry? This book made me so hung oh, hungry. The description oh my of God. wine <laughs> was kind of like, and wine is Le Petitian still open? I need a croissant. Yeah. I need an almond croissant now. <laughs> exactly. Stat. Yeah, I was so hungry. Yeah. So one yeah. of our other attendees asked, what do you think Anne Ma's book revealed to you about young Jacqueline Kennedy as a young American lady living for a year in Paris? Sort of the Emily in Perry yeah, yeah. Um, of the experience. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was like, you know, we can do two on the nose about Jack, you know, and obviously this has, you know, been the point of this conversation, but I also think about like how many other women would have also loved um, the opportunity to be career woman. You know, it sort of made me think of the of, of women at that time as a whole, like just sort of opening it up a little bit and, and how much great talent there was um, and skill that we have lost out on in both, you know, in the arts and business and also because, you know, societally that's, they weren't really given the opportunities mm -hmm. to shine. That's a great point, and I, I was struck by the real the the, the political ferment in, into which she was and cu cultural mm. ferment. You had Malraux, and you had Sarge existentialism. You had all this stuff happening. It must have been unbelievably exciting time uh, to be in Paris. But at the same time, as I said, still very much scarred by the war. Still very much you know all these all these kind of um, continental wounds, um, geopolitical wounds happening, and of course the Soviet presence. So just there was so much going on there. Um, yeah, and then I think you know, for Jackie, it, particularly the sort of op the, the sort of thirst for knowledge and the openness to being yeah. wrong and to and to uh, ha having an eye towards towards learning something, you know, particularly like you know, communism for the, like going in thinking of it one way and being mm -hmm. open to um, a, a different interpretation or at least seeing multiple points of view. I think she says at one point in the book. Um, that she learned that she had she had this thirst for knowledge and it was okay to have that, you know. And yeah. I think for, for a young woman of that era, that that was must have been a really revelatory experience. That's a good segue into into the last question that we have right now. We might have um, time for one more if somebody wants to drop one in really quickly. Um, but Mrs. Sally says, "Did you find out why any of you um, why she chose to marry so soon and why she gave up her craft in the beginning?" You can give a historical answer or a speculative <laughs> answer. 
Um, well, she she met Jack Kennedy, who was one of the most charismatic, attractive men alive. Um, so I think I, I think a lot of her her planning went out the door with that. But um, you know, you need to read my book <laughs> to figure out. What, <laughs> I don't want to give I don't want to give the store away here. You hear that, Jackie? To me, add to cart. Uh, you can I've drop read, the link in the chat I've box. Read all of By the way, books. Steve Steve also did a nice blurb for that one. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. It is fascinating to see Jackie in in the framework of these three different stories, as you said at the beginning. When you know the the part that we know, the public, um, the public facing historical part is in the middle, and we. But it's so lovely to get to know her in Paris through Anne's beautiful mm -hmm. book and then get to know her as she meets Jack and we're led through it by Lim and then to visit her again on the other side. So I do think these three books are so nicely in conversation with one another, yeah. as we like to say in the book, the book business. Um, so we thank you again for being here. Let's see, we've got one last. Oh, we just have a comment that, that lots of people I'm sure have all three um, books. Thank you. And, and, and if anyone doesn't, um, we can help you fill in the gaps with whichever you're missing. Um, but thank you all for being here with us to launch Jacqueline in Paris. We are so excited to finally be able to sell this book at East City Bookshop, as I know so many bookstores around the country are. And of course, our hearts and our thoughts are with Anne and her family. Um, and again, Steve and Lou, thank you so much for being here for this great conversation. Well, and thank you, and thank, thank you, you all for, for supporting you. Anne and her family, and also for supporting independent bookstores too. I mean, Woo! what a couple of years you guys have had having to to really upend your whole business model to survive on certain times. And I'm so thrilled that even a newer store like East City uh, not only survived but it, it but found a way to thrive. And it's it's because people continue to support independent bookstores. So thank you to everyone Yay. who comes to programming like this. Thank you all. Buy, I know, and, and then and buys everybody's the book. writing such yeah. great books. That's why we want to keep doing it so we can keep selling yeah. these wonderful books. So um, thank you to um, to everybody for being here. Thank you to both of you for this great conversation. And we're all we're all thinking about Anne um, and everybody who loves her, which is so many people. So and many of you are in the audience. So thank you all. Thank Good you. Good night. Good night.